Hi, everybody. I thought I'd bring Honey back on screen. She's grown a little bit since the last time you saw her. She's such a good girl. You heard, oh, there you go again, just like you did last time. Okay, we well, thank you. I got to get to our study right now. But say goodbye to everybody. Hello and goodbye to everybody. And I'm going to send you off, okay? So we'll see you later. Oh, there we go. So there she is, our precious little honey girl. Next time, maybe you'll meet Sunny. I don't think I've introduced you to Sunny before, but uh, anyway, glad you folks are here with us. I sure hope you had a chance to look at the last session on the 11th century. I'll talk more about that in a second, but welcome to Heroes and Heretics, the history of the Christian church. This is part 33, the 12th century, where we specifically look at a couple of events, controversies, and then we're going to talk about two main characters who knew each other, but were not friends. Late in life, they reconciled. But in any event, we're going to talk about Bernard of Clairvaux and Peter Abelard. They're going to be the ones we're going to be looking at uh, today. So again, I hope you're all doing well and enjoying these simple lessons on church history um, as much as, maybe even half as much as I enjoy uh, preparing them and sharing them with you. So, uh, in our last session, I don't think I have anything more significant to tell you, uh, other than the baseball season's almost over. I only have six more home games to work for the Rays. But today, I'm working down at Tropicana for a special event. Jane Goodall, remember the uh, lady scientist, anthropologist, um, chimpanzeologist? She's going to be down there speaking to uh, thousands of, of kids and whomever. And they needed some helpers down there. So I'm heading down there at 4 o'clock. But in any event. In our last session, we looked at the events and individuals that left their mark in the 11th century. We examined one of the most significant religious changes of all time, that being the Great Schism, otherwise known as the East-West Schism of 1054, which divided the known Christian world into two separate entities, the Roman Catholic Church, the West, centered in Rome, and the Orthodox Church, the East, centered in Constantinople. And as I said at the beginning, if you haven't watched that video, I strongly urge you to go back afterwards and look at it because it will explain the doctrinal and cultural differences uh, for the split, which I will not be re-examining, you know, today. But it will help you understand who these two groups um, are. We also looked at the great theologian, thinker, and philosopher Anselm of Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury. We specifically saw an Anselm as a very important character in the uh, history of the church. But we specifically saw that Anselm helped formulate the ontological argument for the existence of God, which pertains to God's necessary being which we'll talk more about in a few sessions from now when we talk about the great 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas. Anyway, Anselm was also responsible for getting the thinkers of the church to consider the difference or the relationship between reason and faith. His most famous quote regarding this distinction is, I do not seek to understand in order that I may believe but I believe in order that I may understand. Now that sentence represents the theological method stressed by Augustine of the 4th and 5th centuries and of course Anselm of Canterbury in which one begins with faith in God on the basis of that faith that um, then moves us further on to understanding of the Christian faith. And that faith isn't just a rational decision of the mind apart from God's spirit because um, we're deceitfully wicked above the mind 
is to sing this the heart is wicked and beyond you know cure that we're not going to think you know godly thoughts on our own so we don't come to faith just because of a rational decision to do so but rather our salvation starts with the gift of faith that comes to the sinner by the grace of god the spiritually dead sinner is brought to spiritual life by the imputation of christ's spirit into them by God's grace, which then gives them the ability to begin to grasp the truth of the gospel. You don't come to, you don't figure out all the, the, the gospel and the arguments for the existence of God and whether Christ rose. Or we don't figure that all out in our head first and then say, okay, I like that. I decided now that I've rationally thought it all through, I'm now going to have faith and trust in that. That's not how it works. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. In other words, your carnal um, reason. It is the gift of God, not by works, which if I made the rational decision apart from God on my own, that would be a work, so that no one can boast. And of course, Hebrews eleven six 6 tells us, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. Have faith, not have all the evidence, but believe, trust that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Seek, seek him. Anyway, Anselm's other major contribution to the Christian faith was his book, why did God become man, which is a comprehensive and convincing argument for the substitutionary theory of the atonement. Christ died for us not to pay a ransom to the devil, which was previously believed, the ransom theory, but rather Jesus died in our place as our substitute to appease the just and holy wrath of God against the guilty sinner. Thus we are saved, not just from the devil and sin, but we're saved from the wrath of God that was due to all fallen sinful mankind. Again, I showed you the, the book by R.C. Sproul, Saved from What? Where we're saved, yes, from the devil and from sin and from spiritual death, but we're saved mainly from the wrath of God. Again, Anselm was a very significant thinker in the history of the church, and I strongly urge you to listen to that last session, last session on the Great Schism and Anselm. Now, I did also mention in that previous lesson that in this lesson, I was going to focus on the Crusades. But I decided to wait another week for that because the eight main Crusades, which have been completely completely misunderstood by the modern church and the world span the 11th and 12th and 13th centuries. So I want to focus the entire teaching of next session on that subject. I will be sharing with you the truth about the Crusades. We'll dispel the myths about the Crusades. Forget about what Presidents Clinton and Obama apparently representing the Christian religion, don't know why they would be, but they apologized to the Muslims for the Crusades. They were completely wrong for doing so. And I will explain to you why in our next class. Hopefully that will stir you to listen to it. So for today, I want to focus on one important controversy, the investiture controversy, which I'll explain in a moment, and two major characters of this 12th century, as I mentioned, Bernard of Clairvaux and Peter Abelard, two fascinating and colorful individuals within the Christian church. Now, first, the investiture controversy. That's invest, I-N-V-E-S-T-I-T-U-R-E. -E. The notes will be at the bottom. Is probably completely foreign to most of you, but as you will soon see, it was or dealt with a very important issue that developed in the 11th and 12th centuries. The investiture controversy was a conflict between the Holy Roman Empire, meaning the emperors of the time, and the Roman Catholic Church over the authority to appoint church officials. 
This controversy lasted from 1078 to 1122 and was resolved by the Concordant of Worms, or Worms, but in German it's Worms, W's are RVs, as in Wagner, the great Jewish classic, classical uh, com composer. It's not Wagner, like my best man, David Wagner, but Wagner. Anyway, the conflict was centered on the ceremony of investiture, which involved installing bishops and abbots with the symbols of their office, their vestments. That's where the word comes from, hence the name investiture. Now, you might wonder, what's the big deal about installing bishops and, and abbots? You just prayerfully consider who are the most humble, faithful, devout, loyal, and learned men who could lead the congregants in their spiritual growth and trust that the Lord would raise up those individuals to those positions. But that's not the way it was done during this time of the 11th and 12th century in medieval days. A little historical background. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, when Rome fell, significant, you remember this from previous talks, significant changes took place within the churches of the newly developing individualized German states. No longer was Rome in charge of everything. So all these little communities, in a sense, Germanic, that's that whole area, France and Germany, uh, that we spent so much time talking about. Uh, were gener they generally ceased to look to the Pope in Rome or to the ecumenical councils that we spoke about for guidance. Instead, nobles and especially anointed kings assumed numerous Christian duties, including the protection and the foundations of churches and abbeys. We know that they built. I mean, it was wonderful that the uh, secular governments, you know, that many of the leaders, as we spoke about, came to faith and were supportive, you know, of the church. So they were building, you know, um, churches and, and abbeys and endowing them with, with finances. And that was wonderful. Although the canon law of the church declared that bishops were to be elected by the clergy and the people of their future diocese, which makes logical, biblical, and spiritual sense, as I mentioned to you, it was ignored by the state and the church. Bishops and abbots were nominated and installed by the secular rulers in a ceremony known since the second half of the 11th century as investiture. The consecration of the newly appointed bishop by his ecclesiastical or church superior then usually followed. Now this ceremony was seen as a way for rulers to pick their own people who were going to really side with the government and so they could draw bishops closer to themselves and make them more reliable government officials. In other words, the secular rulers would appoint their favorite and most loyal citizens regardless of their spiritual condition. Thus was often this was often coupled with what has been commonly called simony. We talked about this before, the practice of the rich paying considerable amount of money to the rulers, both state and church, to guarantee their appointment. In other words, if they're looking for a new bishop of this diocese, of this church, of this area, then someone with a lot of money would say, oh, ooh, my, my son, yeah, he ought to be bishop. Well, what are you going to do? How, how are we going to, you know, and they'd give him a lot of money and he'd be appointed, you know, the bishop. This name, simony, that's called the practice of simony, of paying for a church position. That's taken from Acts 8, 9 through 24, when Simon the sorcerer wanted to pay Peter money to obtain the magical power of the Holy Spirit. And they were, he was strongly rebuked for that. However, it was also criticized as a violation of the church's independence, of them choosing who was going to be the next ruler. So this practice where secular leaders like the emperor directly appointed church officials by giving them the symbols of their office, their bishop ring and uh, crossier, C-R-O-S-I-E-R, -E which was the hook staff, 
carried by the bishop as a symbol of the church office. You would see ancient uh, not photographs, ancient drawings, paintings of bishops and whomever, and you often see them holding that shepherd. That's what they're supposed to be, the shepherd's you know, crook. That was called a crossier, C-R-O-S-I-E-R. -E and this was called uh, lay investiture because it was the lay people, not the clergy that were picking the people. And this was the core issue of the controversy. The controversy came to a head after Gregory VII was appointed as Pope in 1073. He wanted to bring serious reform to the church and clergy by stopping the practice of simony, clerical, that's the not clerical as a secretary, clerical as in the clergy, clerical, I guess, marriage, and this anti-church practice of lay investiture. Gregory VII excommunicated the emperor, King Henry IV, which only aggravated the controversy. It wasn't until 1122 in the 12th century when Poth Calaxtus, C-A-L-L-I-X-T-U-S II, and Emperor Henry V, not the hermits, her hermits, I'm Henry VIII, I know. Anyway, but this happened in 1122, as I mentioned, at the Concordant, that's C-O-N-C-O-R-D-A-T, a meeting in Worms, in Worms. They agreed to end the practice of investiture. The agreement differentiated between the royal and spiritual powers and gave the emperor a limited role in selecting bishops in the Europe, Western Europe, Germany, you know, area. Now, there was a similar controversy going on in England, which started in 1102 between King Henry I, all these Henrys, King Henry I of England and Pope Pascal II. The English res, uh, dispute was resolved by the Concordant of London in 1107, where the king renounced his claim to invest or appoint bishops. And this was a partial model for the Concordant of Worms 15 years later. Okay, So the investiture controversy had several outcomes. You're thinking, well, this isn't very important. Well, it, it, it is important for these reasons. Oops. The controversy helped to limit the state's ability to misuse and abuse religious power and authority. It strengthened the papacy, which led to the papacy growing stronger in its power and authority, which is not necessarily a good thing. And it also influenced the, uh, the concept of secular government, a true separation of church and state. Okay? So, that's an important event that, that occurred during this 12th century to show you the separation of church and state there and how the government you know, the rulers were dictating who would be, you know, I mean, that'd be like the, the mayor of Largo deciding who's going to be the next pastor, you know, Grace Christian Fellowship. That ain't got to work. Now, to move on to our two main players or influential leaders of this 12th century, the first person I want to look at is Bernard of Clairvaux. And Clairvaux is a nice French uh, city, uh, C-L-A-I-R-V-A-U-X. Now, first, though, some background leading up to his story. You'll remember the importance of the monastic movement and the monasteries during these times. The monasteries that I, I share with you the last time, the time before, that I used to think the monasteries were just quiet places where people went to get away from the world and just pray and read all day long. But they had a major impact on, on societies. They were a great resource of education, art, theology, raising up and, and training and, and uh, training devoted, you know, clergy, and a rich center of community life within a town or a city. Uh, this town or city was often built around the monastery. Now, as the influence of the monasteries grew, so did their wealth. People would donate much money or would will their wealth to the monasteries at their death, often as a good deed to help with their salvation, which is not biblical, but they would still do that. 
there were different religious or sacred communities within the Roman Catholic Church called orders. And you're familiar with this, such as the Order of St. Benedict, Order of St. Francis, Order of St. Augustine. At this time, the 12th century, there were monks called mendicants, M-E-N-D-I-C-A-N-T-S, or those who took mendicant orders, and these friars and religious sisters lived and relied on almsgiving, charity, and begging for everything. They strongly believed that Jesus and the disciples were not wealthy and that they lived by, by faith. And this is their, their attitude that these, these monks you know, had. So one such community which branched off from the Benedictines was the Cistercian. I think it's how you pronounce it. C-I-S-T-R, C-I-S-T-E-R, C-I-A-N, Cistercian order. And it was started in the French area of Cito, C-I-T-E-A-U-X, Cito, south of Dijon. I don't know if that's where they invented the Dijon, you know, mustard or whatever. Now, this community by far was the most influential and the most popular of the reformed monastic orders of this time to come from this area of France. Now, the uh, Cistercian order, if I'm mispronouncing it, just roll with me, was wildly, wildly popular within a number of decades. And there was somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand monasteries that were connected to them. It was founded in 1098, uh, and the Cistercian Cistor, Cis, order was poised to be ready to really be the moral and conservative voice of the Catholic Church. Now, just a number of years later, you know, it started in 1098. Just however many years, you know, later in 1112 there arrived a man by the name of Bernard. Bernard was born in 1090 in Burgundy, which is northern France there. And so he was 1022 at the time. Uh, and he was born to a family of lesser nobility, meaning his family weren't officially considered of the class of nobility, but close enough. And that might not be a good explanation. Bernard's father, uh, Tess. Tessilian, T-E-S-C-E-L-I-N, he left for the first crusade when Bernard was six. Now, it appears that his father was among the crusaders who objected to the excesses, such as the attacks on German Jews, that marred what turned out to be the only successful crusade. More on that next session. Now, originally, Bernard was being raised to be a nobleman of sorts, but he chose to become a monk. Although he never sought high office from his monastery, he advised kings and popes and was virtually the uncrowned leader, ruler of Europe. That fact that a monk who seldom left his monastery could exercise such an influence testifies to the tremendous respect in which spiritual leaders were held. The ability of one man without political office or power to change history solely by his teaching and example is without parallel until the 16th century, century when Martin Luther could once again transform Europe from his pulpit and professor's chair at the small town in Germany called Wittenberg not Wittenberg, remember, W, V, Wittenberg. Now, back to 1112, when Bernard showed up at Citeaux, 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 C-I-T-A-U-X. I can barely speak English here. I'm trying to speak French. Bernard didn't just show up by himself to join this uh, monastery. Surprisingly, he came with 30 of his friends and relatives. 
Now these these would be the extended family of, of all kinds and friends. So there seems to have been something of a revival in the Bernard household that they all agreed to join this Cisturian, Cistercian order in order to live a life of piety and faithful monasticism and, and poverty. Three years later, after his probation is over and after he is fully a brother, Bernard is sent to the city of Clairvaux, the one word I can get pronounced correctly, where he is to establish a new Cistercian, Cistercian, that's it, Cistercian order there in that city. And for that reason, that Bernard is forever known as Bernard of Clairvaux. Now, this is where all of Bernard's ministry is carried on and conducted. And by the end of his life, Bernard will become one of the most influential thinkers and teachers of the entirety of the Middle Ages. In fact, when Bernard's teachings were embraced by the Catholic Church fully, he was given the title of doctor, which I'll remind us that a doctor in the Catholic Church is someone whose teachings are considered to be authentic to the Catholic Church itself. And just a bit of trivia, there's 37 doctors in the history of the Catholic Church, including uh, Irenaeus, Augustine, Ambrose, Athanasius, Bede, Aquinas, and others that we've already spoken about. Well, Bernard is one of these doctors who was also referred to as Dr. Uh, Melifluous, Melifluous, M-E-L-L-I-F-L-U-O-U-S, which translates uh, as the pleasant sounding, as the pleasant sounding. That's what Melifluous means, pleasant sounding. So he was the pleasant sounding doctor, which is appeal to his preaching. His words, his style, his rhetoric, the tone of his voice seemed to have a mesmerizing uh, effect on audience wherever he, he preached. Now, first and foremost, Bernard is the most cited medieval writer by anyone when you include, this is interesting, both Protestants and Catholics into that category. A category. So both Protestants and Catholics look at Bernard as a, a godly man that they need to listen to. Protestant reformer John Calvin in particular is excessive in terms of his love for Bernard. But Bernard is one of these beloved figures, whether someone is Catholic or Protestant, whether they are medieval or modern, Bernard is just that powerful of a writer. And in part, it's because of his preaching. Bernard was a biblical rigorous. Bernard was one of these folks in the Middle Ages who, while not opposed to rhetoric and not opposed to logic, which we'll talk more about later, is perhaps the strongest single voice in defending the claim that if a doctrine is to be believed or taught, it must rest on Scripture. But we're going to have a question about that later on when we see something that Bernard uh, believed in. Logic is something that is applied afterwards and not something that you bring to the scriptures themselves or something that determines truth itself outside of scripture. And this would be very relevant when we talk about the second fellow who was opposed to Anselm, that's Peter Abelard. Now, when it comes to the doc to doctrine, there are a couple ways that this rigorous commitment to the scripture presents itself. First and foremost, Bernard is one of the great defenders of of the method of biblical reflection that we today call Lectio Divina. Lect, it's Latin, which is Latin for divine reading. Lectio, L-E-C-T-I-O, Divina, D-I-V-I-N-A, divine reading. Now, Lectio Divino, uh, Divina is a Christian prayer practice that involves reading meditating on and responding to the scripture in order to increase knowledge of God's words and promote communion with God. It's a practice that we all ought to consider making a regular part of our devotional life. And to be a blessing to you, here are some steps for practicing Lectio Divina. I'm not saying I practice this, but it's worth something looking into. First, prepare. Set aside time to read, 
reflect, and respond to the Holy Spirit. Second, read. Read a passage of Scripture aloud and listen for words or phrases that stand out. Read it a number of times out loud and listen for the words that you think might stand out. Third, meditate. Reflect on the points that stood out during the reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. What does it mean that my, the, the Lord is my shepherd? That means he's a personal, he wants me. He's my shepherd, he guides me, I'm a sheep. You see, I shall not be in want, meaning as a shepherd, he'll care for me. So that's reflecting on the points that, you know, that you're reading about. Respond, record your thoughts through prayer or journaling. Lord, I'm so thankful that you are my shepherd. You see what I mean? And then lastly, contemplation. Spend some time in silent contemplation and allow the Spirit to speak to you regarding the word that you just read. Now, Bernard wasn't the inventor of this, but he was a great defender of it. And what he's getting at very often is the real combination of the devotional life with the intellectual life something that Peter Abelard was opposed to, as you will see. Now, another way that this presents itself is in one of Bernard's greatest and most read books, and it's his book called On Consideration. Again, this is a book that is still in print, and I have it on my computer, and it was widely read through the Protestant world and in the Catholic world ever since the Middle Ages and after the Reformation. One of Bernard's friends and former disciple at Clairvaux eventually became Pope, Pope Eugenius, Eugene, I-U-S, Pope Eugenius. So Bernard wrote this to him as Pope, as Pope who had been elected to the office with little or no theological training in his background other than what Bernard taught him. Bernard, rather than complaining about the Pope's inexperience, turns instead to write a book about how one ought to approach the Christian life and theological reflection. And it's one of the masterpieces of the Middle Ages in terms of laying out a clear rationale for the Christian life and the life of the mind. It is a book that is still read by anyone in the Roman Catholic Church that rises to the new position of spiritual authority, whether it's Pope, Bishop, Cardinal, whatever. They probably have already read it in seminary, but they reread it again as they are lifted to another position. And it's read by uh, Protestant pastors to help them to keep a balance between the professional life as a pastor and administrator and their personal devotional life to the Lord. I've said it before that one of my shortcomings as, as a pastor, I loved the people, I loved preaching, I loved caring for the sheep, whatever. But sometimes I got so busy preparing for like two or three Bible studies I taught a week, plus Sunday morning sermon, that all my Bible reading was in preparation for those talks, as opposed to me quietly sitting alone with the Lord. And, and reading the word just for the sake of hearing his, his voice. I admit that, that that was a shortcoming of mine. Okay, another way that Bernard is cited as being a real advocate for perhaps an ecumenical approach to the divisions between Catholics and Protestants is that Bernard, above all medieval theologians, is the strongest theologian committed to a real intense Augustinian idea of grace. So you have to understand the Catholic Church was already beginning, and this is what ends up happening in the um, during the time of the Reformation, is that they were moving more and more from the grace-oriented teachings of St. Augustine, that we, we live the Christian life because of God's grace to us. We're saved by God's grace, and not by our good works, but it was shifting now. As I told you, people would put in their wills to give tons of money to the uh, monasteries, which is a fine thing to do, and everybody ought to do that. You ought to will part of your wealth, you know, to your local church. That's a good idea. But they were doing it in order to win their salvation. See, it was 
grace or the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ plus your good works. But St. Augustine said, no, 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 that's not how it works. It's all by grace. Well, Bernard was a strong voice at this time about the subject of grace. And of course, um, he does reflect, of course, out on the need for good works. Good works are still a part of your Christian life, but they're in terms of the result of our salvation through Christ. We do good works because I love Christ, not so I can get Christ to love me. But he is not one to try to figure out a way to make works a requirement, Bernard was. And of course, the Roman church, again, was already moving towards a Christ sacrifice plus good works as the mean of salvation. But at least Bernard wasn't afraid to emphasize grace and grace alone. And it shouldn't surprise us, since I already stated he was a biblical rigorist. He took seriously the power and the truthfulness of God's word. Okay, so if those are the highs, if those are the things that people love so much about Bernard, we have to be honest, there are a couple places in Bernard's life and in his ministry and in his writings that people, mainly Protestants, often cite as being problematic. The first, and this is where his idea of being a biblical rigorist seems to fall through the cracks, where he starts accepting doctrines that aren't biblically warranted. The first is that Bernard was instrumentally involved in preaching, which helped launch the Second Crusade. Now, as you see in our next session, when I talk about the Crusades, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's probably not correct to say that. Uh, but it's probably not correct to say that if it were not for Bernard's preaching before nobles, stoking up their desire to go to the Crusade, that the Second Crusade might not have, have happened at all. The Pope had called for it, but the Pope's call was really only met with lukewarm response. And Bernard steps in and through his preaching and through his political connections of all kinds, eventually inspires Europe to go on the Second Crusade. Now, those who are not very big fans or advocates of crusades or would have been misled like a few U.S. presidents I know, as well as general skeptics of Christianity, tend to find a great deal of reason to doubt whether or not this is a man we should listen to at all because he encouraged the Second Crusade. But you're going to find out next week the, the truth about that. Now, here's where he gets into trouble, I think. It's Bernard's involvement in the next two issues that Catholics and Protestants are definitely divided regarding how we esteem this man. First and foremost, and I think I've used that expression first and foremost three or four times already, so I'm sorry about that. So, importantly... Bernard is one of the earliest, strongest, and most zealous defenders of the extreme veneration of the Virgin Mary. He advocated praying to Mary. No word in Scripture does it tell us to pray to Mary to the saints. He spoke of the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary, that Mary remained a virgin all her life despite the fact that Mary had brothers and sisters uh, and if they had older brothers and sisters from Joseph's you know, first so-called marriage, then they would have gone with Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem for the census, since the whole family had to go, and they're not mentioned there. So he believed in the per perpetual virginity of Mary, and in some ways he leans toward this idea that Mary is co-redemptrix, although he never called it that which is the idea of Mary playing a key role in individual salvation, and that is she's instrumental in the process or the plan of salvation, not just the mother of God, but rather that she herself plays a role in the salvation of individuals themselves. Again, this is very interesting because, as I said, Bernard was a biblical rigorist, and that he would pontificate, or promote a doctrine that wasn't spoken of clearly in the Bible. Yet he lifts up Mary, his his, he lifts up Mary uh, higher than the scriptures indicate. Plus, he advocates ideas that would later become dogma of the Catholic Church concerning 
Mary. See, these things weren't dogma yet. He's writing about it, and later the church takes those things and what previous people had made comments about. And they made dogma, her perpetual virginity, praying to Mary, and Mary being a co-redemptrix, none of which have biblical warrant. Now, from the Catholic side, again, Bernard is not the first to come up with some of these doctrines, but he's the most zealous and he is the most passionate about these doctrines that in many ways, uh, the long history, the Catholic Church reflection on Virgin Mary can said to start in some ways at the headwaters of Bernard, at least in terms of an overt, on paper, deep reflection on Mary as part of the prayer life and part of the devotional life of the church. Now again, he's not the first. This had been on the rise in the Middle Ages for some time, but he is the first to put, to really put it on paper in terms of defending it. So he's often cited as the one of the first and foremost important defenders of certain doctrines related to Mary. Now it's worth noting again, Bernard is the most beloved writer among Protestants, and they are aware, at least in the historic context, of Bernard's advocacy um, from any of these doctrines. And it just goes to show that for many, they may not like his understanding of the teachings of the Virgin Mary if they're from a, the Protestant camp, but they nevertheless respect the other things he has to say on doctrines. The same is true with, with other great teachers of the church, even St. Augustine. I believe St. Augustine believed in baptismal regeneration. You know, remember, babies died very often in childbirth. And I think that's why infant baptism was so important in the, in the early, early church and even in the Reformation with the, with the Protestants was because of the high death rates. We better take care of these babies right away. So I may disagree with St. Augustine on his view of uh, baptismal regeneration, that you're saved at your baptism, but I'm not going to throw everything out the, out the window with that. Now, with my remaining time, I would like to talk about a contemporary of Bernard, Peter Abelard, Abe Lard, A-B-E-L-A-R-D. He is often looked at as the bad boy of Christian history, bad boy of the, of the church. And it should be noted right up front that I think I already said that Bernard and Abelard did not like each other. Now, Peter Abelard, and from this point on, I'm simply going to refer to him as Abelard, was born in 1079 near Nantes, N-A-N-T-E-S, France. He was the eldest of several brothers and at least one sister. His devout parents sought to bring him up to be both learned, learned and pious. Once again, as I'll discuss next uh, session, on November 26, 1095, when Abelard was 16 years old, Pope Urban II preached a sermon at Claremont, which is on the way to uh, Orlando, uh, Zahili, no, uh, that, that he preached this sermon in Claremont that was instrumental in launching the First Crusade. A French pope on French soil calling for a holy war stored many to the nightly pursuit. And by nightly, I don't mean day, night. I'm talking about night as in K-N, to be a soldier. Abelard cho chose not to go, but rather wanted to become a theologian and a teacher. He was quite an astute, astute student and became famous, so to speak, for arguing cleverly against his professors, who soon came to despise him for his arrogance. Now, part of Abelard's problem, his arrogance, if you want to call it that, was that he was a strong follower of the dialectic teachings, D-I-A-L-E-C, T-I-C teachings of the ancient philosophers Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. Now, specifically, he adhered to their scholastic view of argumentation. This is where the dialectic comes in. Instead of taking something at face value, Abelard and these ancients believed that it was important that you dialogue with others, specifically those who disagree with you. 
not for the sake of debate or to win the argument, but rather they felt that you would better understand your view if you understood the other side of the story. And maybe that new understanding would help better mold you in your own idea. You know, the Socratic method of Socrates was to ask back and forth, ask questions and doubt, not for the sake of beating someone, but say, now, why does that happen? Why do, you know, it's the one thing that we don't see happen in interviews today with politicians recently, hint, hint, that there's no follow-up questions. I mean, my goodness. Well, I believe there's such and such. Okay, let's move on to the next subject. No, 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 no. What do you mean by that, madam or sir? You know, what is, what is your thought behind? You see, that's the Socratic method as far as I understand it. We go back and forth here so we better understand what's going on. So Abelard was consistently arguing, or better put, questioning his teachers, which many of them took as Abelard doubting their understanding. So although he was a believer, a Christian, he felt that it was important to look at doctrinal issues in a multitude of ways instead of just accepting something purely by faith or just because a learned man from the ancient past said something was true. Abelard placed reason, this is important, at the forefront of everything else. He believed that God is a reasonable God and of course he is. Thus man, since we're made in his image, should be able to come to an understanding of God through logic and reason. This would be contrary to what Anselm and Augustine previously taught, that faith comes before reason. We come to believe, have faith by God's grace. Hence, we then can reasonably comprehend the deeper things of God. Again, logic is good. God is a logical God. But fallen man, who is also finite, limited, is not capable of understanding the infinite. As the Lord said in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't comprehend the deep things of God. As I'll say in a second, we can't comprehend how the Trinity is. We can do our best, and theologians have done so, but it's still a mystery. Now, Abelard did agree with Augustine's view that understanding and trusting God first starts with an illuminating spark from God. Both Abelard and Augustine would call this grace. But the difference was that Augustine said that the illuminating spark was the imputation of the Holy Spirit that granted faith first. It made you alive. It opened your eyes first. That's the trusting faith. While Abelard believed that the spark brought the ability to logically reason, which would bring now the wise man to faith. Abelard's belief system would eventually set him at odds with the established church, especially with Anselm. So after engaging, uh, angering enough of his teachers, Abelard ends up in Paris in 1108 and starts his own school. If uh, your teachers aren't agreeing with you, then quit and start your own school. Well, in 1115, he begins to teach at the Notre Dame University, at the cathedral there. In 1118, this is important, he takes up residence with one of the leading priests at the university named Fulbert, F-U-L-B-E-R-T, and is later asked to privately tutor Fulbert's niece, Eloise. Here's where trouble begins. Some scholars say that Eloise was 14, 15, possibly 17 years of age, and Abelard was 20 years older. With that in mind, Abelard begins to tutor her, and in their personal relationship there, he begins a passionate affair with the brilliant Eloise, an affair that actually becomes public, and Abelard allows it to become public. Abelard was apparently also a composer of music, 
So he writes Eloise's name into his love songs and his students start singing them to the tune of musical instruments. So this becomes a public scandal. And remember, he's not a priest. He's a, a professor, a teacher. But uh, the idea back then is that if you're a, a teacher, and of course, he, I think he wanted to eventually become a priest. But if you're a teacher being married and having children, you know, is going to muddle the, the waters there. So this was a, 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 a scandal. So this becomes, again, a public scandal. And remember, this is a woman, young woman, who was sort of assigned to Abelard to educate her. And apparently he decides to educate her in other ways, the ways of the flesh. Now, before we blame it all on Abelard, which we will, he's 20 years older, but she fell deeply in love with him as well. That's neither here nor there. Well, sure enough, not long afterwards, Eloise, you guessed it, becomes pregnant. And so what does Abelard do? Yeah, this is a big scandal in church history. That's why we call him heroes and heretics. Although we'll get to the end about him being whether or not he's a heretic. But what does he do? He goes to Eloise's influential uncle Fulbert, a priest at the cathedral of Paris, and Abelard offers to marry Eloise secretly. Now, obviously, the uncle is in no way satisfied with this. First of all, he's not into this secret marriage idea. Secondly, he knows that there's been a public scandal which is hardly validated or taken care of by a secret marriage. Oh yeah, let's just get married and all the you know, scandal will go away. But nevertheless, Abelard persists. He convince, convinces Eloise to do this secret marriage and then he moves her up to Brittany, up in northern France. And in the end, they have a child together who is basically taken care of from that point on by Abelard's sister. They have a son, and they name him Astrolabe. Astro, L-A-B-E. Now, it's interesting, because this is the name of a Persian astronomical instrument that Abelard would, would use to look at the sky. So he names his son after this instrument. It'd be like today naming your child iPhone. Now, believe it or not, Abelard convinces Eloise that she needs to enter a convent as a nun. Hey. Eloise agrees to enter a nunnery and become a nun. And she does eventually become a nun and years later ends up being the abs not abscess, abbess of the covenant. But before all that, Uncle Fulbert finds out about Abelard moving her uh, to a convent, and he thinks that Abelard is basically throwing Eloise aside, throwing her under the bus. Let's just get rid of her. Abelard is more concerned with his future as a scholar and lecturer than being a husband and a father, although he initially deeply loves Eloise. He just loves his career more. So because of Abelard's decision, Uncle Fulbert, the priest, is so enraged that he brings together a group of his servants and tells them to go to Abelard's house and uh, teach him a lesson. Make sure he won't mess around with any other female students. So the servants capture Abelard and yep, they castrate him. Ouch, or I should say, ouch. Turns out Abelard kind of accepts his forced castration as a just punishment for his sin. Later, he would say that he had two great vices, pride and lecturing. And I think he could add lust of the flesh. About his pride, as well as his lecturing pride, pride about himself, but pride about his lecturing, he would boast that he was the greatest philosopher of his day and that he remained undefeated. No one could outsmart him when it came to debates about theological issues. Eloise continued in the convent, and as I said, she became uh, the uh, abbess of the covenant, and she and Abelard went their separate ways. But they did correspond quite regularly for a while, and these love letters of sorts eventually were published as a very famous and insightful book, and you can probably find it you know, online, whether you purchase it or just read it online, I'm sure you, you can. Eloise deeply loved Abelard, but eventually Abelard wrote her that their relationship would never work, 
uh, mainly because he was now pursuing the, the priesthood. He became a monk, lived as a hermit for a while, and of course he's castrated as well. And that their relationship would never work out. So he asked that she'd never write him again, which she agreed to do or not do, not write. So Abelard himself becomes a monk. He joins a monastery. And interestingly, unlike Eloise, who basically becomes a nun for Abelard's sake, because he told her to, Abelard begins to like being a monk and uses his uh, monkhood, if I can use that term, or maybe his monkery, to become a scholar. He writes an important work on the resurrection and important works on the atonement. But remarkably, these are works that get him into major ecclesiastical trouble with the church. Regarding his view on illumination, reason, and wisdom, remember he, he put reason above all else. This is where Abelard started to get in trouble with the church. Because he was such a fan of Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, and since he believed that logic, reason, and wisdom are gifts of God's grace, I mean, the scriptures even talk about wisdom and, and, and personify Jesus as, as wisdom, then he believed that although these early philosophers knew nothing of Jesus Christ, nor were they converts to Judaism, because they were wise and cherished wisdom and reason, then they must be saved also. He was so intent on believing this that he dug through all of their ancient writings to find references to point that pointed to a sovereign God, and in particular, that they believed in the Trinity. He had to dig really hard, and none of his findings were convincing to the Christian scholars of his day. Even the greatest, and of course, he'd come up with bizarre thoughts from them and say, see, that alludes to this, you know, whatever. Even the greatest secular philosophers of his day and today who were advocates of Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato saw nothing in their writings that indicated that they were in any way, you know, believers. So he kind of taught a form of universalism or that maybe not that so much that uh, because these people were wise, you know, then they were must be saved because wisdom comes from God. Mm. But see, that was his way of not accepting something purely by faith. Now, regarding the Trinity, since Abelard strongly advocated a reasonable and logical understanding of all things spiritual, he had some different ideas about the Trinity. It's not that he denied the truth of the triune God, but because the concept appeared unreasonable or that he believed it was, you know, incorrect to simply believe by faith in the mystery of the Trinity. Why do you believe in the Trinity? Because we see evidence of the scripture, but it doesn't make sense. Well, we just have to accept that. Then he leaned towards the heresy of Sabellianism that we talked about in the past, which is modern-day modalism, the one oneness Pentecostals, the TJ, DG, TA, whatever, Jakes, is a oneness Pentecostal. They talk about the Trinity, but they really don't believe in the Trinity. They say God the, Fa God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit are just one God, oh, which, of course, we believe, but just one God, and God's wearing three different hats. When he needs to act like the sun, he wears the sun hat. So in other words, there is no, you know, trinity. That's modern day modalism. Now, Abelard didn't want to believe that, but that was where his logical approach was taking him. The Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in the trinity. If you have a conversation with a Jehovah Witness and they bring up the trinity, they're going to say, number one, is trinity found in the Bible, the word? Well, no, it isn't. Well, then how can you have a three-headed God? That's what you believe in, and they'll show you in their magazine of this God with, with three heads. Christianity doesn't teach that, you know, at all. But here's their point. They will say, but you can't understand it. Well, of course you can. not How can the finite comprehend the infinite? Now, regarding the atonement, Abelard rejected the early idea that Christ's death paid a ransom to the devil. We talked about this when we talked about Anselm. 
but he also rejected Anselm's substitutionary view, which is the orthodox view held by most evangelical Christians today. Bernard, a strong advocate of Anselm's view of the substitutionary death atonement of Christ, clearly argued against Abelard, often by sharing rather ugly insults. <clears throat> Abelard's view, which is accepted today by some very, very liberal theologians and groups such as the Unitarian Universalists, is called the moral influence theory of atonement. And instead of viewing God, now here's the substitutionary uh, view of the atonement, which we believe is orthodox. Instead of viewing God as a just and holy God who must deal with sin aggressively, in other words, through death, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that the wages of sin is death. Hence, Jesus died as our substitute. Abelard promoted a loving God, which of course he is, but canceling out the just and holy God, and that Jesus died for the demonstration of God's love. He demonstrates his love for this in the, uh, love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. A demonstration that can change the hearts and minds of sinners, turning them back to God. Jesus' sacrificial death was a moral example to us. And thus we should lovingly accept God's love and be saved. Now this heretical views, his heretical views were challenged by Bernard of Clairvaux, condemned at the Council of Scenes, S-E-N-S, -E in 1140, and eventually he was excommunicated. Now the excommunication, excommunication from the church was withdrawn because of devoted Christian friends of his, and in particular a man named Peter the Venerable, who ran the influential monastery we spoke of recently at Cluny, C-L-U-N-Y. So he lives out his life under the care of Peter, and although his Christian status is restored, Abelard's health begins to deteriorate. He dies around the year 1142, and is buried alongside Eloise, believe it or not, in the same cemetery in Paris that Jim Morrison of the Doors is buried. If you remember, Jim Morrison died while in Paris of drug and alcohol overdose and was just buried in that, that cemetery. I don't think they're near each other, but anyway. So the question is, was Peter Abelard a, a Christian? Well, folks, only God knows a person's heart. While Abelard conflicted with the church to the point of, later cleared, of heresy charges, he never de denied his Catholic faith, which doesn't necessarily mean he was a, a Christian, but he, he believed that Christ's sacrifice, etc. Many would say that Abelard was indeed a believer, but that he had different ways of viewing or reasoning out his faith. Now, this is interesting, In, and I'll close with this. In November 2009, Roman Catholic Pope Benedict XIV spoke to 15,000 people at St. Peter's Square about the controversy bet between Bernard of Clairvaux and Peter Abelard, mainly about the controversy regarding faith and reason. Again, only God knows a person's heart, but this is a small part of what the Pope said about these two men. He said, however, now there's more before and after it. I'm just reading a short paragraph. However, Abelard was a conflicted person. Pope De Benedict explained that he had a religious spirit, but a restless personality. And his life was rich in dramatic events. He challenged his teachers and had a child by a cultured and intelligent woman, Eloise. He also suffered ecclesiastical condemnations, although he died in full communion with the church to those authority he submitted with the spirit of faith. So the Catholic Church believes he's a Christian. I like to think so too, and I like to think that uh, where he got sidetracked was with his overemphasis of reason and trying to explain things, and he kind of explained this thing himself into almost unbelief. In any event, there's your 12th century. The investiture controversy, we talked about Benedict of Clairvaux and Peter Abelard. Now, of course, there's crusades going on in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century. 
we will talk about them next time. So I hope that's helpful for you. Lord, thank you for meeting here with us. I didn't pray at the beginning, but thank you. Lord, I do pray that the things we talked about today would stir our faith. I shared some verses of scripture with us, Lord, some good gospel verses, Lord. I pray that you would speak truth to us and that we would understand the very thing that Augustine and Anselm and the Apostle Paul and millions of others have come to realize that we're saved by grace through faith, that you impart within the sinner your saving grace, your faith, that you give us the gift of faith. Spirit, Christ's Spirit comes within us that wakes us up, opens our eyes, unplugs our ears, uh, softens our heart, that now we can receive the things reasonably, logically, that you've spelled out through your word. Lord, thank you for this time. Bless your people. Encourage us. And Father, we love you. Thank you for first loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope this was helpful. Feel free to share it with someone. Like it. Subscribe to it. It really does make a, a difference, folks. Okay? I love doing this. And next time we get together, we'll talk about the Crusades. We'll dispel the myths of the Crusades. Okay? Hey, how about if we close with a little more of that fun music, if I can find it here. And this is called Playful Joyful, whatever that means. Boy, it sounds like a good rocking song there, whatever. But it's royalty free, so I'm allowed to play it for you. So on that happy note, let's uh, see you later. And I'll kind of fade it away here if I can. See you again real soon. Bye now.